right, good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, we're here with Mark Travis, uh, who is our awesome pre-concert talk lecturer, and uh, he will talk uh, a bit about the classical part of the concert um, with Aldo that is coming up in November 10th. Aldo is incredibly busy, so um, it was uh, impossible to get him on, on Zoom. Um, and um, I see he's not here yet, so he's still busy. <laughs> so I, I'm assuming he's going to tune in uh, in a few minutes. Uh, but Mark, I'll let you start off, uh, start us off with um, what um, Aldo is planning for us uh, to play uh, on the November 10th. So those of you who are, uh, you don't have tickets yet, uh, be sure to check him out and hopefully you'll be able to join us. Thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you, Milana, and good morning, everyone. Uh, so nice to see all of you again. Uh, if there are some new faces, my name is Mark Travis. Uh, I have uh, a day job uh, in New York City as the director of media production for the New York Philharmonic. I've been on the full-time staff with them for uh, 10 years now in three different roles over the course of that time, but actually have a freelance relationship that goes all the way back, um, well, over 20 years old, uh, 22 years, um, back to the late 90s. Uh, so uh, it's as always, it's a joy for me to have this chance to talk about um, other kinds of literature because, of course, you know, um, I'm a fan of, of so many other things, but in particular, the uh, piano repertoire. So uh, it's I can't wait. I, I was very excited when uh, Milana told me that she had booked Aldo um, for these concerts, uh, because he, I think is a really great example of where I think we're going to see music go over the course of the next 30 or 40 years. You know, somebody that really is equally at home in both jazz and classical techniques and is also thinking about composition and we're going to be treated to a program of his works. And I'm really looking forward to hearing what he has to say about his process and about, you know, how that developed. I mean, that's an old model, isn't it? You know, Rachmaninoff, you know, he was a great pianist composer. Uh, Mozart was a great pianist composer. So many of the uh, composers uh, that we continue to celebrate to this day were a part of it. They, you know, it's not that they just did one thing. Most of them did uh, a lot of different things. And I think that's kind of true for careers across the board um, in uh, in music, you know, same in, in my specialty of production. It's not enough just to really um, focus in one area. And most of us don't want to. We have other interests. We want to explore um, music and production techniques and the presentation of music in, in different ways. So uh, I love the program that Aldo has put together, uh, the second half anchored, you know, by about a 30 minute uh, set of his compositions. But then he gives us some more traditional fare that really was programmed in a very thoughtful manner. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, just get us a few slides as some prompts. And... Just a reminder, I think when I saw there are still a couple of good seats available for uh, Aldo Lopez Cabilan, uh, November 10th, St. Louis Catholic Church in Bonita Springs. Uh, so he begins us with music of Claude Debussy. Uh, I love this photo of Debussy. Usually we see this kind of headshot of him and he looks a little not downtrodden, but just very serious, a little beatnik-y with um, his Van Dyke. I like here that I see a little bit of wit and charm and humor in, in the eyes in, in this photo. You know, he looks like somebody that you'd want to, you know, have a, a cask of wine with, uh, you know, at a local Parisian cafe. Uh, a point about WC that sometimes is talked about, sometimes not so much. I, I think it can be lost two things, really. One is his dates. We hear his music and we it's so sophisticated and it's so of another world. It's very easy to think of him as a 20th century composer. 
And while his music certainly did, most of his uh, greatest works come from the 20th century, uh, he didn't live that long into uh, the, the 20th century. Uh, we lose him, unfortunately, to colorectal cancer at uh, a relatively early age. Um, but he was a bit of a late bloomer, at least in terms of his fame. You know, certainly he had some successes early on. Uh, Prelude to the Afternoon of the Fawn, one of his best known compositional works uh, or uh, orchestral works, is performed late 19th century. Uh, the Debussy Nocturnes, which we revere, of course, as pianists, uh, emerge also very late 19th century. But it's not until 1902 that he sort of takes the world by storm with the uh, production of his first and really only opera, Pelias and Melisande. And Pelias and Melisande starts to show new things are possible in the way that people are thinking about opera. Uh, it even calls for an unusual voice type that really only exists in French opera called the baritone matin. Uh, these days for Broadway, we would just call that a baritoner, you know, meaning somebody that kind of has the husk and the core of a, of a baritone voice, but has that upper register of, of a tenor. And um, it's, a, it's a very difficult piece to cast well and to project well, but in terms of the way that it washes over the ears and explores new harmony and just opens it up to interpretation in both in, in a more abstract sense, was, was groundbreaking for Debussy. So that puts him you know, really firmly on the map in 1902. And so then throughout the you know, few years that remain to him, we start to see some of his greatest works. We see the homage, which are on this program. We see the homage uh, for orchestra, uh, also one of his favorite, uh, most famous works. We see the Children's Corner Suite, uh, the oratorio, the martyrdom of St. Sebastian. So it was really much of his finer work and the, the works that we celebrate and revere come from, you know, a period in his 40s and beyond. Now, Debussy's music uh, was called impressionistic at the time, but he really objected to that term. Uh, impressionism has always been, maybe because of Debussy's attitude towards it, a bit of a sensitive topic in music. When I was going to music school in the 90s, in fact, you know, we said that Debussy was the only or the closest that the music world ever had to an impressionist composer of really reflecting those kind of um, textures, you know, that we see in the painting of the day, you know, in the Degas or Monat, Monet, uh, painting. But I think Debussy just kind of thought he was writing the music that he wanted to write. And he sort of saw himself as this heir to the lineage before him of, you know, going all the way back to Rameau and continuing, you know, through the works of uh, Beethoven and Mozart. And Certainly, he was aware of what Brahms was doing, et cetera, et cetera. You know, he was firmly wanting to write the music that he wanted to write. He didn't want he didn't want a label. So um, we're going to hear uh, the image, uh, book one and two. There is also a collection of image or images uh, known as the image oublié. Uh, Debussy writes to his publisher uh, Dorin. Quote, without false pride, I feel that these three pieces hold together well and that they will find their place in the literature of the piano to the left of Schumann or to the right of Chopin. And there, too, just this notion, maybe this is why he's objecting to being labeled as an impressionist. This is the kind of company he imagines himself keeping. And I also think that's kind of a nice mental image to think of Debussy in between uh, Robert Schumann and uh, Frederick Chopin. Um, so there are two collections, each is in three movements that come out, uh, around the same time. They're written between 1901 and, and 1904. And, uh, as mentioned, cast in three movements, we're going to hear book one or volume one of these as performed by Aldo. Uh, 
there's the reflet dans l'eau, which is reflections on the water. It's in the key of D flat major. Then we have an homage à Romeau in D sharp minor. And then finally, simply movement. And here, you know, I can't resist the, the urge to sort of pair impressionist painting with this notion, you know, reflection, uh, reflections of the water. Um, this is actually one of several works that Debussy composes that concerns the water. There's another account where he writes to his publisher about how had music not worked out for him, he really thinks he might have enjoyed the sailor's life and that um, he just loved everything about the sea and loved everything about being close to the sea, loved everything about boats. Uh, this is a fascination. And this is something that we see, you know, of course, famously in his great orchestral work, La Mer, The Sea. But also, um, we start to see that here in, in this piece as well. So it's one, one of several where uh, it's concerned about uh, water. Uh, and indeed, it's also one of his most famous works, you know, Reflet dans l'eau. I probably couldn't count how many times I've heard this work, both on a recital and also as an encore. You know, it lends itself well to uh, both being performed in context and, and out of context as part of a larger uh, program. And so to get this water effect in, in this piece, uh, he employs a number of different techniques uh, to, to achieve this sense of motion throughout. Uh, there are arpeggios, there's pedal point, there's staccato, there's tremolo, glissandos. Um, all of this kind of to show the different characteristics of the water from sort of the still calm of the dawn to the more agitated, you know, white caps, if, if you will, of, of the sea. Uh, Milano, if we could, let's uh, play just a little bit of this. This is late in the movement. And I chose this particular video recording just because it also gives a sense of the atmosphere that Debussy uh, paints in his music. And I think it's also interesting to be able to have this sort of over the top view of the pianist's hands. So we'll hear just a little bit of Reflet dans l'eau. It was maybe a touch short. Uh, Milana, could you back it up just a, uh, a touch? Yeah. If you see this plant Sorry in your backyard, Sorry about don't. That. And don't step on that plant, by the way. That's that's not an impressionistic uh, plant. You ever wondered what act I haven't wondered about that either. <laughs> and Sorry about that, folks. I guess my, my time, really fast my time stuff movie. was just a little rough. Yeah, that's good. Let's just get a little more of the atmosphere. So reflet dans l'eau. So again, you can see, um, yeah, and here just this uh, the way that Debussy is approaching uh, the composition. You know, this idea of reflecting uh, water in his music. So we continue then as uh, the homage continue. Uh, there we go with the homage à Rameau. And um, this work is more subdued in nature. Uh, it's written as a sarabande, which is a Spanish dance in three. Uh, that's an oversimplification, of course, but it was a, a very um, common compositional technique. It was something that composers of the day and, and beyond uh, enjoyed 
uh, replicating in their music. And importantly, it pays tribute to Jean-Philippe Rameau, uh, who along with Haydn and Bach sort of represents the, the Baroque period in, in classical music. It's interesting that we have these three really strong figures. Uh, Johann Sebastian Bach, who lives from 1685 uh, to 1750. Uh, you got George Friedrich Handel, who is born the same year, 1685. Uh, he outlives Bach a little bit, uh, lasting until 1756. And then you have Rameau, who's a couple of years older than both of them, born in 1683. And he actually uh, enjoys the longest life of the three as well. And it's probably just as well that he enjoyed that long life, because similar to WC, and maybe WC identifies with him, and that's yet another reason why uh, he decides to uh, make Rameau the focus of this uh, middle movement, is that Rameau, too, was a late bloomer in music, at least as, as we think of it. He didn't really have a great success. His first major opera uh, emerges when he's around the age of 50, and especially for the Baroque era, that was, that was a late bloomer. Um, and so uh, they have that in, in, in common. Rameau, again, along with Bach and um, Handel, is responsible for much of our pedagogy in Western music, the way that we think about harmony, the way that we think about counterpoint, uh, the way that we just think about music theory, and uh, really stands in August company as uh, being a, a leader uh, of, of that movement in music. So uh, what we hear in this uh, piece compositionally, um, certainly, again, it, it, it is a little bit of a slower burn, but I like the harmonies in these chord blocks. You know, that reminds me of the organ. And um, indeed, you know, that was, that was the main instrument, you know, for uh, these Baroque masters. And um, let's uh, play Milana, just a, a little touch of this. This is uh, from our good friend, uh, Marc-Andre Hamlin. I think it's uh, also enough to kind of give you the, the flavor of this uh, middle movement of the first book of Image. And then the piece moves from there or to um, its thrilling conclusion. Uh, are you able to see that? Sorry, I don't know if I reshared my screen or not. I don't think I did. Uh, one moment. Let's go back. Do that. There we go. Um, we're getting ahead of ourselves. Yeah. So we go to, uh, it's simply called movement. And uh, this, in terms of uh, the homage, it's you know, the most abstract designation of the three works. Really, what's of note here is that it's written as a perpetuum mobile. Uh, this is a technique it's because of this technique that we have minimalism today. I think without uh, this notion of perpetual motion, we never have the works of, of Philip Glass or of John Adams, or, you know, they develop independently in some different way. Um, the main idea of it is that this it's this effect, as the name implies, of constant motion, 
Uh, very often it's fast, but there's a melodic material that is carried independently of all of this motion that's happening. Uh, lots of repeats. And this genre really reached the height of its fame around the end of the 19th century. So again, you know, Debussy being a composer where most of the works that we perform today and, and remember today are, are written, say, very, very last years, the 1890s, you know, uh, uh, through the early part of the 20th century. Uh, this was certainly something that he would have been very much aware of. And thinking again of, of pieces as being not just for the concert hall and, you know, maybe to be performed in context, uh, this was a style that many times composers would think of in terms of the virtuosity, that this was the way to give audiences uh, a, a little bit of uh, firepower, you know, for the end of, of their recitals. So, uh, again, let's hear uh, just a touch of it, if we could, Milana. Perfect. That's great. So even when there's lots of things happening in Debussy's music, um, you see that he still manages to have uh, this sense of atmosphere. Uh, conjures just this notion, almost this otherworldly notion, I think, um, lends itself well to, to thinking about musical pictures. So then we move from that piece, uh, The Image by Debussy, um, to a work that um, is written by someone that uh, Debussy admired very, very much, Robert Schumann. This uh, is the Arabesque, Opus 18. See an example of Arabesque uh, architecture there in the background. Uh, the title in this case is really one both of a poetic nature as well as a musical nature. Um, that is uh, Robert and Clara Schumann. Um, yeah, I referred to this last time we talked about uh, Beethoven. We talked about some of Beethoven having, instead of a fine romance, a not-so-fine romance. Um, interesting quote that we pull from the time of uh, this composition. Schumann's about 29 years old. And he says, never refer to me again as the heir to Jean-Paul or to Beethoven. I'm willing to be 10 times less than these others and only something to myself. And it's interesting that he comes to this conclusion. Uh, Schumann he had a, a lot of difficulty uh, in terms of, uh, he, he wasn't a facile composer in the same way, you know, that Mozart could seemingly just, you know, scribble something off and dash something off. You know, Beethoven could half finish a, a composition and still play it that night and improvise, things weren't quite so easy for uh, Schumann. And of course, he also felt weighed down uh, by the uh, people that, that came before him. And he was very much in love with Clara Wieck, who uh, was one of the greatest pianists of her day by all accounts. But Clara's dad isn't doesn't know about Robert. He won't give the uh, permission for her to marry. He doesn't, she, he wants her career to continue. He doesn't want her to go into this life of being a wife and being a mother. And so uh, around this time, it really seems that things between Clara and Robert aren't going to happen. And so he uh, is not in the best of moods. Things haven't gone especially well in terms of his composition either at this point in time. Um, but he is trying to <laughs> do whatever the mid 19th century uh, equivalent of self care is, trying to find uh, his voice, trying to find his muse. So there's an unexpected dedication uh, with this, the Opus 18, and also the work that follows uh, the Blumenstock Opus 19. 
Uh, rather than being dedicated to Clara, these are dedicated to the Frau Majorin Friedrich Serra auf Maxen. And uh, again, you know, because trouble was a brewing with uh, the, the romance that um, uh, Schumann and Clara V had. Um, and, you know, summing up just, you know, what we talked about. Now, one of the ways that uh, Schumann self-cared uh, during, during this period of time is that uh, he did a lot of reading, as I think many of us also do. Uh, and he became fascinated with this uh, book by Christian Schubert, uh, different spelling, no relation to, to Franz Schubert, but uh, it was a book about musical aesthetics and it really inspired Robert Schumann to think about composing in what he called a more feminine style. What I expect he means from that is that, you know, it was something that was just a little lighter and gentler and easy to the uh, to the pianist's touch. And, you know, that that is the approach that he takes both in this arabesque uh, as well as the uh, Blumenstruck that, that follows. Uh, this arabesque is, you know, again, it's um, the title is poetic in nature, but it's also, you know, a musical metaphor for all of these things uh, that Schumann is thinking about. Um, you know, do we hear, you know, true Middle Eastern um, types of phrases in it? You know, maybe we hear French interpretation of that slightly, but it's really about the, the freedom and thinking about music in a different way. Uh, so Milana, let's hear just a little bit of this, the arabesque. And this was a signature work of Emile Gilles, who performs here. leave on that uh, resolution. Uh, so again, it takes us into this world of, of Robert Schumann uh, at, you know, when he's still a, a relatively young man in his uh, late 20s and um, continues in a way, uh, predicts and continues, I guess, the, the music of um, uh, you know, the mood that's established by the WC that we hear uh, before that piece. Uh, then we go into uh, ground where we um, are going to listen to a little bit of music of Johann Sebastian Bach. I'm going to get back into my slides. Here we go. There we are. And... Um, we uh, will hear one of the three-part inventions, uh, number five in E flat major, BWV 791. Uh, I love the fact that we have this homage to Rameau and that we also have one of the three-part inventions on this program. Again, reminding us of where Western music comes from, you know, where uh, our musical lineage is. Um, and, uh, you know, these, these works in terms of you know, Bach's composition are written about the same time as his two-part inventions. I, I would say, you know, it dep depends just how far you went with your piano lessons, whether you ever got to the three-part inventions or not. I think uh, even most of us, even I, and I'm a terrible pianist, uh, have uh, a D minor uh, two-part invention in, in my very limited repertoire. And um, so there are uh, sets of 15, you know, Bach always liked kind of uh, some evenness in his uh, compositions. So there are 15 two-part inventions or 15 uh, three-part inventions. 
And we first see them in this volume, uh, you know, kind of a practice book, if you will, uh, to his son, Wilhelm Friedmanbach, in 1722. And uh, Wilhelm would have been a preteen at the time <laughs> that dad is writing this music for him, if you can imagine. Um, better pianists probably can imagine. You're probably working on this stuff uh, at, at a, an earlier age. Um, we then uh, have another edition that emerges around 1723 or so. And in that version, we not only, you know, does uh, Bach make some revisions to the pieces, but he also includes some instructions. And so notably, uh, I include a quote here, to play cleanly in two voices and deal correctly with three obligato voices, but above all else, to acquire a true cantabile style of playing and to get a good foretaste of the art of composition, end quote. So this is Bach's aim in writing this music. This is what he uh, is hoping that these works will help young burgeoning uh, keyboardist composers to learn. Cantabile, of course, meaning a singing style of playing. Um, and that, uh, you know, it does through, through the study, you start to learn about the fugue, you start to learn about counterpoint. And we should say too, that the invention, uh, we call them inventions, Bach called them symphonias. And sometimes if you'll look at later editions, you might see that term, but they, you know, refer to the same notion of, uh, having a piece. Uh, I also thought, you know, it's interesting that Bach also thinks about, performance techniques and and about the practicalities available. And so all of the two-part inventions and three-part inventions are on the short side, you know, maybe two and a half to three minutes, depending on who's playing, uh, because they were limited to two pages just to avoid the need for any page turns. So I love when we hear about people that you know, really understand the the characteristics of the of the instrument. You know, as a classical guitarist, let me tell you, you know, some of those works that require a page turn, I just you know have to assume nobody ever played the instrument. They would never <laughs> never do that here. So, you know, as far back as Bach, Bach is thinking about the practicality of the performance. You know, just one of the thousand reasons why he uh, was amazing and great. Uh, so I pulled up a little bit of a performance um, period performance. Uh, video of this, which also gives us a view of how the music would look um, to someone improvising a, and, and you know, to how a, a modern pianist would interpret it too. Uh, let's go ahead and hear just a little bit of that. Milana, please. That's probably a good place to leave off. So the three-part inventions of Bach, um, and uh, you know, if you thought the two-part were were difficult, <laughs> take take a look at at, at those, uh, especially as a amateur pianist, uh, sometime, and uh, you're in for uh, a, a real treat. Uh, but I, I love any time that we uh, get this chance to hear uh, the music of Bach on a uh, program. And uh, then we go from Bach to one of the other Bs, uh, Johannes Brahms. And this is uh, Rhapsody Opus 79, number one in uh, B minor. Um, he actually writes uh, two Rhapsodies that are a part of the Opus 79 collection. Uh, this one is the more extended of the two. And it's 
as good an example as any of the mature Brahms. You know, Brahms was another one of those composers, and I know I've spoken about it in previous lectures, that was also had a long gestation period. He wasn't necessarily a late bloomer. He just kind of psyched himself out in a way where he just imagined the spirit of Beethoven looming large behind him and felt how could he possibly uh, live up to the expectations. You know, there were people who had put some faith in Brahms as a pianist and as a young composer, and he just didn't, he sort of suffered under the weight of what did that mean and how could he um, live up to that potential? You know, as a result, famously, you know, his first symphony is developed over the course of 20 years. And um, so he definitely is somebody that's thinking just a little bit. But by the time we get to this work, uh, it's the Opus 79. It's it's uh, the late part of the 19th century. In fact, I think it's 1879 that this piece is um, uh, published. He's feeling more confident. He's starting to, you know, feel in control of his abilities. He's starting to earn the reputation. And there are some really amazing things that are just around the corner for him as well, you know, in terms of the uh, German Requiem. Uh, the second piano concerto emerges a couple of years uh, after this piece and, and some other real milestone works. Um, he also developed some important composer relationships, notably with Antonin Dvorak and Johann Strauss Jr. That's the Strauss that wrote all the waltzes, not the Strauss that wrote Ariadne of Naxos um, around this time, too. And kind of, you know, he's self-aware, uh, I guess, about his maturity. And one of the ways he decides to mark his maturity is that right here, hey, look at my beard. He grows, he was clean shaven and, and rather pretty, you know, for um, most of his early life. Uh, and so he emerges with this big old beard, you know, and that's the way I think of Brahms. In fact, I think, you know, uh, he's one of the few composers I have a little bust of in my uh, um, studio. And I always think of him as, you know, almost looking like an old Orson Welles, you know, with this gigantic uh, beard as, as a part of it. Uh, and uh, so here he, too, has a muse. We've spoken a little bit to that, you know, Brahms had a very close relationship with Robert and Clara Schumann. He and Clara Schumann had this kind of undefined romance, depending on who you ask and what you read into things, you know, how together were they or not. Uh, we still haven't found the definitive documents to say, you know, for sure. We know they were very good friends, that they were very devoted to one another. But Bach also has a very close friend. You know, it's become clear he and Clara are never going to marry. And so um, he has this other friend in Muse and, and occasional sponsor, uh, Lisbeth von Herzogenberg, who appears here. And um, that's, you know, to whom uh, these works are dedicated uh, she also was very much kind of the person that sort of talked him off the ledge, you know, when he thought that he'd overdone it with his second piano concerto. And, and um, you know, she kind of got a first look at some of the symphonies as well. So just a very important figure uh, in, in his life as well. Uh, so let's hear uh, a little bit of this piece, um, if we can, Milana, uh, performed by the great Marta Argerich. <laughs> That's a good place to stop. Yeah. Um, also, just as we hear in those textures, as I think is reflective of um, Brahms, you know, uh, is his ability as a pianist. Brahms wasn't just a functional pianist who could play his own music. He was a great pianist. And there are even, you know, do yourself a favor, do a little deep dive on, on YouTube sometime. You can actually hear him playing some of the Hungarian waltzes in a 
really bad recording, but it's still fun to get a sense of the tempo and and hear his unusually high voice uh, as as a part of it, announcing himself as Doctor Brahms. So um, you know how how wonderful what a treasure it is that we you know have that kind of a document uh, available to us. Uh, so at this point. We have been joined by our artist, by uh, Mr. Aldo Lopez Cavilan, uh, the pride and joy of Havana. And uh, I want to uh, welcome him now uh, to the Grand Piano Series and our talk, because who better to talk about the second half of the program, which, you know, uh, than, than you, Aldo, uh, because this is a program of your music. So what can you tell us about, about this? I, I want to say we do have um, a performance queued up of... Um, the the final piece uh with uh the you and the harlem quartet so we can give people a, a little sample of that uh anytime you like yeah sure let's start off with just a little bit Yeah, what a what a fun piece. Um, so Aldo, tell us about um, this work and and some of the others that uh, we'll hear uh, at these uh, performances uh, in Benita Springs. Well, first of all, thank you for having me. It's a great pleasure to be invited to this series, and uh, um, thank you for the wonderful uh, explanation of the first half of the program. I actually learned some of the new stuff you said there. I didn't know a few details of the, the um, personal details of the composers that, mm -hmm. but um, yes, I enjoyed it very much. Um, well, as you may imagine, uh, this program is going to be uh, this second half is going to be quite different from the from the first part, which is um, because it's composed by myself. Um, Cuban uh, 21st century composer <laughs> with a lot of influences, absolutely. Um, especially from the classical world, um, 20, uh, first half of the 20th century. My favorite composers to play and to listen to um, are not um, especially the ones that I um, uh, chose for this program for the first half, although I love, of course, uh, um, I don't play anything that I don't like to play. So with that, I say everything. So basically, my second half is going to be music by myself, um, starting with, if we are following the program, and it's the same as I sent a few weeks ago, uh, the Princesas, Castillos, y Puntos Suspensivos. That's the Spanish name, of course. Um, that is one of my first compositions that I dedicated to my first piano teacher. I was around 12 years old when I composed this. So as you can imagine, it's a very naive um, and emotional uh, piece, although it's very, very rhythmic. And if, if I might translate this title, is something to do with princes, castles, and suspensive points. So the actual translation would say, about princes, castles, and suspensive points. Basically trying to explain the middle section of the piece, which is improvised. That's why the suspensive points. 
Um, the beginning is a very um, tranquil, um, sort of medieval um, influence theme or harmony. And then the castles part is a very rhythmic, more um, upbeat um, section. And of course, in the second, in the middle part, sorry, is the impro part, which brings, of course, all the elements of the themes and the introduction on the first section. And of course, the recapitulation will bring the whole thing in a bigger uh, sound, you know, a, a more complex, a complex structure. So that would be for the first song. Um, Aldo, can I ask you a question? Are you course. on tour right now with the Harlem String Quartet? I am. I am. <laughs> because I hear them practicing. <laughs> That's awesome. <laughs> so so I'm we staying right now at my brother's in New York. And as you can imagine, this house is pretty much like mine, my own in Cuba, back in Havana, uh, where, you know, all the family are practicing, the kids are practicing downstairs, my brother is practicing upstairs. I try to hide in the further corner where the sound doesn't bother too much, but obviously you can... <laughs> You can hear it, yes. That's awesome. Yes, we are That's awesome. touring with the Harlem Quartet. We are doing the, in the first half, we are doing the um, Schumann Quintet. Mm -hmm. And then the second half, we are doing part of the program you will hear soon, but this in this case with the Quintet on my own, my pieces. Awesome. Fantastic. How long are you planning to stay in the, in the North America tour? Well, um, the tour, it's, it, I have different concerts in different um, towns, different uh, states. So I'll be here for two months. Uh, well, a month and a half now because I've been already uh, performing uh, this couple of weeks. Awesome. Aldo, I'm very curious about uh, your childhood because it's uh, very often do I hear from people saying, oh, you know, I don't believe classical musicians can play jazz and I don't believe jazz musicians can play classical. And you sort of break that, um, that notion. And what I wanted to know, first of all, when did you start improvising and when did you uh, start uh, composing your music? And was it something that was part of your early education, something that... Um, was taught to you or just very naturally you came into it? Well, um, first of all, uh, it's good that there are people that are asking these kind of questions um, or wondering if somebody can play or not different kind of styles. Um, it's a very easy question to answer. I mean, jazz music, classical music, there is this is the same thing is in fact, when you say classical music, you say all kinds of music because in the world of that so-called classical music, we have all kinds of styles of all kinds of periods in history of music from as, as Mr. Travis was explaining, all these kind all these composers belong to a different time in history and they were inspired or um, taught by great composers, great teachers from all over the world and from all times. And each of them have their own uh, approach to music, their own experiences in their lives accordingly to the time they were living. And uh, same happens with jazz or any other kind of um, uh, uh, music, concert music. Um, so in my case, um, I was trained in an academy, in a conservatory. Since I was seven years old, I studied in a music school. Of course, I have to say my parents, the entire family, my older brother, everybody was a musician. It is a musician, they are. Uh, it is a, musician, a musician's family. And um, I have to say, I was uh, born in, in this world since I was able to not even talk. I was already listening to music, singing along, um, messing around with my mother's piano. Uh, they wanted me to play the cello because already my mother played the piano, Ilmar, my brother, played the violin. And my mother wanted this dream 
of having the trio, you know, the cello, piano, violin, piano. Um, and I started some lessons with the cello, but uh, obviously um, the piano was uh, a stronger attraction. And um, since I was literally four years old, I started messing around with the piano. I'm not saying that I was able to play anything, but uh, um, I was actually very attracted, very attracted to this instrument. And I was a very creative um, kid. So I started messing around with the piano and you know making my own melodies, making my own tunes uh, since a very early age. And my parents realized that that was um, something they have to you know let it grow. And that you, that's what it happened. I mean, I started in the music school when I was seven years old. I started learning the regular academic um, two parts inventions and. Uh, all these uh, programs that we kids have to play for learning how to play an instrument and, and learning the history of the of the repertoire. And uh, well, I started to uh, excel in those um, school competitions, pro province competitions, country competitions, international competitions. Everything was growing up with that era, uh, that um, area, and. Um, Besides that, at the same time, I never left uh, my creative side. You know, I, I always wanted to compose, improvise. Improvisation was a natural thing for me to always um, uh, uh, do it. Even when I had to practice my repertoire from school, like Bach, Mozart, Chopin, um, I would improvise on, on those elements and uh, do my own things. And, you know, my mother and my father, screaming at me, stick to your, <laughs> stick to your scores and uh, do the impro with your own style. And, uh, but of course they, they were aware that that was a side that I could not lose of the opposite, completely the opposite to enhance that um, skills. And uh, that's what I was doing very naturally. Uh, I have to say, I never studied in a, in a conservatory composition or improvising or jazz. All of this has been on my own interests and, uh, you know, learning from different sources, videos, recordings, um, you know, these kind of things. Do your, uh, I understand your daughters are also uh, taking music lessons. What instruments do they play? They are, they are the beautiful. They play piano, both of them, especially because uh, the teacher is the same teacher as was my teacher, Hortensia. Altman, a great uh, kid teacher for piano, which also uh, was a student of my mother. So it's a, it's a long line of, you know, um, uh, let's say relationship, uh, love, and uh, it's kind of a family, right? So they're very happy with the piano. And beside that, they, they, they wanted to do something else. And I was very happy with that. So one of them, Adriana is learning guitar and Andrea is learning flute. And they're very, uh, you know, excited with those instruments. They also sing, they sing songs to voices songs and they accompany themselves, which is fantastic. They, they are bringing all the, the, the sources of our family together. Incredible. <laughs> so you have a lot of music between the grandparents, parents, and you and the kids, and everybody is just making music, which is fantastic. That's, yes, yes. Aldo, is home a Havana? It is. It is. Yes. It's not as cold as right here. <laughs> <laughs> right. <laughs> Mark, if you have a few questions more, and then we can probably open it up to our audience. Yeah, um, well, I guess the other just in terms of, you know, the things that you were listening to, you know, what, what were some of those things, you know, because, of course, you know, we talk about, um, uh, you know, Art Tatum and Oscar Peterson and things. I'm just curious, you know, what are um, some of the, the recordings, you know, jazz or otherwise that, you know, sort of helped you find your identity as a, as a composer or start to discover your voice? I see. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's an endless list of uh, recordings we we heard and we studied, um, starting from, yes, of course, Peterson, of course, um, 
but um, I was more into the new uh, the new era, like Keith Jarrett, okay. Chick Corea, um, um, Dave Rubik, mm-hmm. um, Lyle Mays, uh, Berto Gismonti. Uh, you know, there, there's an endless list of uh, pianist, composers, mm-hmm. improvisers that I admire very much. And um, did you I get would, to make, meet uh, Chick Corea before he passed? You know, of course, we just lost him. I, I didn't. I, it was mm-hmm. a, it, it was a shame because it was a pity. Sorry, because um, he definitely. Uh, heard about me because of my brother my brother recorded with him and toured with him yep. uh, and and he showed uh, one of my pieces and he was very excited uh, he liked it very much and he wanted to meet me and of course I, I was uh, desperate to meet him but we, we never couldn't make it interesting but uh, uh, yeah. And, yeah, uh, also not only jazz or the so-called jazz um, but um, world music in general, I was very interested in, in Asian music, especially from India, Trilor Gurtu, uh, Ravi Shankar, um, and all these great musicians. Uh, of course, the flamenco idols like Paco de Lucia and uh, Tomatico, all of these guys. Um, the Brazilian music, of course, is one of my uh, most uh, influences right the biggest influence all these great um songwriters and musicians from brazil you know all over the world i have to say it's, it's very hard to put um a favorite uh, style aldo uh, a lot of people you know they they want to put a category they want to to put an artist or music into a category into genre what are your thoughts on that well, I, I think it's, it's very valid. There are many, many types of music. That is for sure. Like there is many types of cultures or even, you know, ways, ways of thinking or appreciating art. But um, I think it is, it's like everything, you know, you can uh, categorize whatever you like, but if you lose the whole picture, is, is not as interesting because as we probably would share this, so um, music is one language. Uh, so we all live in one world and we all belong to one universe. Um, it's, an, it's a way of expression. It's a way of, uh, you know, throwing your emotions there and, and and I think it's something so powerful and so special for each person individually as for a whole nation or for a whole um, a species like we are, species. So um, in my case, I, I think music is one thing and uh, it's, it's different sentences in a paragraph or in a different novel. You see what I mean? Different chapters from the same novel. <laughs> Very interesting. Um, Mark, I know you probably have to jump off and go to the Met Opera. <laughs> However, I do want to give a, a, a chance uh, to our audience, just in case they have any questions. Um, uh, please feel free to ask them. I can still hang up, you know, here. <clears throat> Daniela, you have a question? Uh, I, I we can't hear you. No, I can't hear you. No, your mic is not working problem. Sorry. <laughs> Type it in. Greg, you have a question. <laughs> um, well, while, while Danya fixes her microphone there, I was wondering, uh, Aldo, when you hear someone play one of your compositions, um, do you think you listen to it differently? And if so, um, what are you looking for when you hear your compositions as opposed to when you hear the music of other composers? Oh, that's a very nice question. Very interesting. Um, well, it depends who who plays it and how. <laughs> um, I'm not a very 
uh, picky uh, composer. I mean, I don't put too many instructions in the score. I I'm more like a Bach kind of guy. <laughs> they just put the notes there and, and you take care of yourself. <laughs> no, of course, I put more details now than Bach in that time. But um, um, generally, I have the, the luxury to hear great performers uh, performing my music and uh, very close to my world. They, I mean, they know. Um, where I come from and what the kind of style I am looking for. Um, so they, they, they played pretty good. And I feel very good I'm actually sitting down and enjoying my music, not played by me, because it's a huge difference performing your music than enjoying somebody else's uh, performances of your music. And um, I mean, for me, it's, it's very hard to understand every single um, approach to your music, to, to your our, our own music. It's the same when I perform uh, the great classics. You know, there's so many different versions and they have different approaches. Uh, I was actually enjoying the examples of, of the little um, fragments that, uh, you, Travis was um, playing for later on, earlier on. And uh, I was thinking, wow, these guys have so uh, personalized uh, versions of this music, or maybe it's my own personalized version that is so different from them. <laughs> so it's, you know, you know, I don't know if you understand what I'm trying to say. It's, it's very enjoyable to watch and to enjoy uh, different versions of the same material. Right. Do you ever? Did you ever feel that uh, when you hear, it, you say, "No, this is definitely not what I meant. <laughs> this is very different from what I meant." Yes, unfortunately, yes. Uh, <laughs> especially when it's about um, a, a more traditional Cuban style, which is very tricky with the rhythm and the syn syncopations. And, uh, you know, uh, sometimes it's very accurate what is, you know, they're playing what is written, but sometimes music is impossible to re re write down the, the, the actual uh, flow of, of things. You know, it's like swing in jazz. You know, you, you could uh, write down and if you, write, if you really play it doesn't make any sense. You have to swing it like with the Cuban um, uh, flow, with the Cuban style of rhythms and, and uh, you know, the bass line, if you that syncopation, uh, many musicians can perform it right on tempo metronomically, but it's hard to, to get in the, in the flow, in the right flow. So it's not always what you expect. I completely, completely understand. Actually, it's uh, it is hard, you know. If 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 you haven't listened to a lot of that music and it's in your blood, sort of, you know, it's it's difficult to. I, I heard Daniela speaking before, so your microphone is uh, fixed. That's what I was wondering. Is it working now? Yes, it's working. Yeah. Okay. Great. Very <laughs> good. Uh, yeah, I didn't dare type my question because it's so many details. Okay. <laughs> you know, I don't imagine. Go ahead, Daniel. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, I was just trying to get a picture of, so uh, listening from about the description of your family and career and uh, knowing, histori you know, having Cuban classmates in school, just historically we understand how challenging it is for somebody of that part of the world to have any access to the United States. Um, so how was your path actually? Are you, you said Havana is home, uh, but you're currently in New York. So uh, how much time do you spend in the States? Is it a challenge for you to come here? Um, was most of your education in Cuba or some of it here? How's that whole um, moving over the border working for you? <laughs> uh-huh, sure. Um, yes, and, my- And impacting, and impacting your career therefore, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, I live in Havana. My, my family is there, my home is there, my house, my piano, everything is there. I travel quite often to the US, um, but it is a big challenge. It's a tremendous, complicated process to get the working visa to perform. Because, you know, we have different 
regulations. Um, America has different regulations and different visa styles of visa types. Um, I have a working permit, I have a tourist visa, but every time I have to come here to perform, I have to ask for a working visa, even though I have the, all, the, all the above before. So it is complicated. And in this moment, um, the American embassy in Havana is closed. It's been closed for more than four years now, and it hasn't been reopened. Hopefully, there are some hopes that it will reopen probably next year, but we don't know yet. And um, so that situation is very complicated for me because I have to go to a third country, either Canada or Mexico, to the consulate there and ask for an appointment. And, you know, it's an endless um, process of different um, procedures to get the visa. But finally, I could do it. And um, I'm here another time, and I'm gonna be performing various con concerts with the Harlem Quartet, with piano solo, with the, my brother as a duo. And uh, next year I have also more dates with as a soloist with the orchestras in the country. Uh, we are recording um, very soon in November with the Harlem Quartet, a, a new album with my compositions. We are looking very much forward to that. So yes, we have a very busy calendar in the US and hopefully I'll be able to get the visa for each time. <laughs> well, we are absolutely thrilled to have you with us. Aldo, can't wait for you to come here. We're planning um, some you know, educational activities as well with kids and uh, I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, meeting them. We had, um, an event yesterday in Bonita Springs Elementary School. <clears throat> and um, as the fifth graders were leaving uh, the cafeteria, that's where the performance was, uh, mm -hmm. one of the kids screamed, I love classical music. <laughs> so <laughs> you, will, you will really enjoy them. They're incredibly adorable uh, young, young kids. And um, everybody who has tickets, uh, that's wonderful. Those of you who do not have your tickets yet, make sure you get uh, your tickets to come to here. Aldo, we have a fantastic venue. We have two stunning screens on, uh, on the side of the auditorium where you can see the close up of the pianist hands. And mm -hmm. uh, there is no bad seat in the house. So grab a seat, come to join us on November 10th. That's when Aldo is going to be performing. And uh, Aldo, thank you so much for tuning in. I, I, I know you have a busy schedule, so I really very much appreciate it. Thank you. And thank Bye. you. Bye-bye. Wonderful. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. I'll see you in November 10th. Awesome. Or before that. <laughs> yes.